Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Are you fine? Okay, cool. My name is Ayabong Atawe. Um, yeah, I wear many hats. Um, I'm a member of the National Council of Equal Education. Uh, I'm also a technocrat in the public service. Um, and this afternoon have the uh, fortune of being able to quiz a few of our political parties on some of what their manifestos say about uh, issues in particular in basic education. Um, so we have a, f a few of our parties here today. We have the Democratic Alliance. Uh, we've got the Freyheitz Front Plus, uh, FF Plus. We also have Action SA, and we also have Ingata Freedom Party uh, as our guests. And you might be asking, why those? Uh, I already said earlier, the optics seem like a very selected sample. Not at all. Um, the organizers had reached out to all political parties. And I think as we can all understand with the uh, strains uh, and exertion of the campaigns, uh, many of the other political parties could not be here. But uh, we'll certainly have, I hope, a very fruitful discussion and an informative one. Because in the next, uh, over a week or so, we are all going to be heading to the polls. Uh, many of those who are voting overseas are voting today in many of our diplomatic missions across the world. Um, and so certainly an opportunity once again to better inform ourselves as it is our civic duty um, as, as voters. So without much further delay, um, let me call up uh, from the Democratic Alliance, Sergio Dos Santos, who's the shadow MEC for education. Please give him a rousing applause. <laughs> So as Sergio comes up, Sergio's got about five minutes or so uh, to just share some priority areas. Please, Sergio, take a seat. Some priority areas in the manifesto of the Democratic Alliance. Um, and yeah, I might have some questions and uh, prompts thereafter. Uh, so Sergio, let me hand over to you. Basic education from the age of seven through to the age of 18, uh, at the most impressionable, but also at the most fundamental uh, phase of the development of many of our citizens. What is the Democratic Alliance saying in its manifesto on the score? All right. So thank you very much for, for having me and afternoon to everyone. So we've got a failing education system. We've got a system where we've got almost 81% of our grade four learners that cannot read for meaning. We have to change that. We've got a number of learners across the country that cannot do well in numeracy. So there has to be a change to improve the uh, quality of education. With the current government, it, it's more focused on expanding education, which is equally important. But the quality of education is not what it's there. We've got poor management at schools. We've got poor teaching, um, unequal access to, to digital um, Wi-Fi. So there has to be some changes. So as the Democratic Alliance, and we use our examples of what we have done and achieved in the, the Western Cape. So what we are saying as the Democratic Alliance is that we need to ensure that every single learner across the country gets 210 full days of learning. Over and about that, the foundation phase from grade three to grade one, we need to have the first two hours of every single school day that is focused on reading and understanding for meaning, reading and writing. And then in an additional hour in the day that is solely focused on numeracy development. So there has to be those type of changes. Um, there's also the, the, the need to make sure that the quality of grade R is at a level that each learner, when they start at grade one, they are already at that mm -hmm. certain um, area. We also need to promote uh, STEM uh, subjects. And we also, by ensuring that there's access to, to internet, we can also give the ability for all schools to have better access to, to Google for uh, research processes, for STEM subjects and so on. But there's also the problem with regards to quality education and quality teaching. Right now, and unfortunately, we've got unions such as SATU, which is putting a, a, a stranglehold on, on education. They are promoting their own interests, sometimes with uh, the assistance and the guidance of uh, certain political parties. But also the, the, the ability to, for schools to employ educators is also stifled because of the SATU um, wanting to, to control that system. 
So in terms of the uh, learner dropouts, when we're looking at the percentage given by national government, which is at 81%, uh, the true dropout is actually at 55.1%. Now, what government is doing when it comes to matric, they look at how many matriculants wrote and how many have exited the matric system. But when you're looking at the number of learners that had started from um, grade eight, and then looking at it at grade 10, and the number that um, has actually matriculated, that number becomes 55%. That's the true pass rate, because you've got a lot of uh, learners that are dropping out of the system. So we need to ensure that we have a system where the learners get good education. And as the Democratic Alliance, we want to reduce that number by, well, reduce that number by 10% annually to ensure that the learner dropout, the true learner dropout, is much lower than what it currently is. The problem with, as well, coming back to the grade four learner... Maybe just on that, how are you going to do that? How are you going to keep more of these learners in school? So we need to improve the education system. As mentioned before, we need to improve it. We need to ensure that the curriculum is expanded, especially when it comes to uh, grade 10. But we need to ensure that the curriculum is expanded so that people that are maybe not necessarily more academically that they can go into vocational um, uh, subjects as well, giving them the ability to go through to uh, varsity. When you're looking at uh, TVET uh, colleges, where a lot of these learner dropouts go through to TVET colleges, 60% of those cannot even find employment after that. And then there's also problems going into to NASFIS, which we may may not speak about it, but. In terms of NASWIS, and it's also quite important, and I just wanted to mention it because I think it's, our, our proposed um, system is, is quite good. The current system that we currently have is that if you do not find employment after you have uh, qualified, you do not need to pay it back. Mm. So we're looking at about, in, I think it was in the last financial year, it was about 41 million rand, billion rand, sorry, 41 billion rand that, didn't, that doesn't get paid back. So the system that we're looking at and we're proposing, as an example, we're looking at a tier system. So a household income from, say, zero to uh, 350,000 would get six, uh, full uh, scholarship. And then from 350,000 um, up to 650, it would be 66% and so on. So we need so to on a, on a kind of what? cascading scale yes yeah. okay. so the, the poorest of the poor would get a full uh, scholarship and then as the annual income increases okay. in terms of the household okay so sergio we're out of time i also kind of gave you a Bracella point there uh, because we're not talking about high education today uh, but um, i'll certainly accord the other parties the same uh, but thank you very much uh, for that point um, and also i guess uh, on your response about how we keep more of the learners in school just maybe one question. Um, the point you raise about SATU uh, is often made in the discussion synonymous with the absence of a performance management mm. framework between the state as the employer of teachers and the teachers themselves. Um, just some thoughts on not only the SATU issue, I don't know how you would deal with that, maybe you might want to touch on that, uh, but also how you would govern a performance management contract between teachers as, employer, as employees and I guess the government at multiple levels is the employer. So what we are proposing, and you know, the, with the poor quality teaching, so we we proposing that we test the teacher competence after they have um, after the initial training. Um, also introducing an independent um, evaluation, national evaluation after uh, grade three, six, and nine to evaluate the quality of education that mm -hmm. we are receiving. Um, also the different interventions that are needed in different areas. So as an example, when we're looking at, uh, at the new Bella Bill or the Bella, Bella Act, it was just passed yesterday, it kind of wants to so take just, power... So the language way. issue. Yeah, yeah okay. so that's as well. Mm. But it's also wanting to centralize what happens in different schools and in different provinces. Mm. The problem with that concept is that a school in Gauteng may be very different from a school in Limpopo. A school mm. in, in Houghton may be very different from Shoshenguwe. Mm. So there has to be 
some sort of system that we understand the community, the SGBs, which are actually elected by the, the schools, mm. by the community and the parents, that actually have a better say as to what is happening sure. in terms of... Um, so you want a much more federalist arrangement. Correct. Uh, okay, Correct. maybe last question we have. How are you going to fund the Wi-Fi in the schools? The Wi-Fi. Yeah, so yeah. that is something that is already being rolled out, like in Gauteng and in the Western Cape, we have been rolling out the uh, Wi-Fi access. So Wait, is that a, different to SA Connect? Or? No, there's different partnerships. So okay. if you're looking at these different partnerships, um, I know of schools in the south of Janusburg that I think is, it's Vormital or Fox or something like that. So there's different... So the private sector funds. Private sector also comes in. So that is basically what we want to look at. Is it expanded into all the schools, but also looking at collaboration from, uh, from okay. independent um, organizations that can assist with that type of funding. And what does the private sector get in return? Private sector, they get advertising. They get okay. advertising. All right. Now, look, it's also the, the organization's ability, the, the, what Jenny called the triple bottom line, is what do you give back to society? Okay. So that's something that we really need to inculcate in, in South Africa and ensure that when these independent organizations, mm. such as collaboration schools, they also get something out of sure. it. Okay, Sergio, yeah. thank you very much. Awesome. Please thank give Sergio De Santos a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sergio. Thank you so much, Fred. And all of the best with the thank campaigns. You, Thanks, thank man. Thank you. So, at this stage, allow me to call up uh, from Action SA, uh, Me Peggy De Brain, uh, former MMC uh, for social development in Tswane, uh, and also a, a former educator herself. Please give her a rousing applause. I'm in the hot seat. You're in the hot seat. Hello, ma. Hello. Okay. Uh, I like the uh, tribute to the party colors. Uh, Hate to do it. I love it. I love it. Please Hate give Mama it. a round of applause. My bosses are watching. <laughs> no, Peggy, same question I, I posed to Sergio. What does the manifesto of Action SA uh, have on offer? for the basic education sector and all of the stakeholders in that sector? Yeah, as Action SA, we feel that there's actually a lot to be done, you know, a lot to be improved. And we're not taking away what has already been done, but there's still a lot to be done. You know, my starting point would be even the curriculum. The curriculum is very wide and leaving little space for, you know, depth. I'm, I'm a teacher, you know, I'm a mm -hmm. female teacher, where you have to chase the ATP and you know, you know that the mixture of our classes where you have learners who are not equally gifted. So I think if we were to trim down, I think COVID to a certain extent did help us in trimming down the, 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 the curriculum mm. because then it leaves the teachers burdened. That's one of the things that we really have to look at. And we strongly feel that we also have to reintroduce teacher training colleges. Mm. You know, I, I'm a product of Transvaal College of Education where what we did most of the time was, you know, to be taught on how to teach. But these days you'd, you'd find someone who did HR, then having to do a, a year's course so that one can get into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, I, I strongly feel that if it's not broken, why fix it? Why did we even have to, to close the teacher colleges? So that's one of the things that we have, we have to look at. And we're looking at also psychosocial support for learners. You know, I've taught a lot of learners and I was not empowered to even identify their learning mm. disabilities and the sad thing is that these learners have to be retained in grades you know because the teacher doesn't even understand and then you refer these cases to the district mm. the districts don't have education psychologists mm. that's one thing that we really really also have to prioritize honestly and we feel that that's one area that we're also going to focus on to make sure that children are given attention and these disabilities are identified at an earlier stage you know, even, even, even at, at ACD level, why not? Mm. So that then we strain them accordingly to where they should be. And obviously the past percentage. Past percentage is something that we're also going to focus on, depending on the subjects, especially uh, critical subjects, you know. We know mother tongue is a bit higher than the other subjects, but feel that if we encourage our learners to be focusing on getting 30% for, for argument's sake, we, 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 we're not doing justice. You know, it's like we're just pushing quantity instead of quality. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing 
that, but I know there are challenges, as a, as a former teacher, I know there are challenges and they need to be obviously addressed. Uh, another area that I think we're not focusing on that much, when, which is also disadvantages our, as a party, you know, our, 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 our learners is also the neglect of extracurricular mm. activities. I specialized in English and physical education. And it was so sad to see teachers not interested in even doing some of these extracurricular, you know, activities. But when it's time for, you know, IQMS, when we have to check our performance, we always say, I do netball, I do that. So I think mm. that, you know, Department of Education at provincial level, national level should start, start you, know, you know, reviving school sports. Mm. Some of these learners are not academically gifted, but are gifted in, in other areas, but we're not giving them enough support. You know, and I'll also touch on the the the, the influence of, of of unions. I think we need a situation whereby we we we, we don't have a situation actually avoid a situation whereby unions have more of a say in terms of promotion of managers. You know, you know we see it a lot. We see it a lot in schools, and we will find that schools are deprived of the real people, the right people would be able to, to lead such institutions. So unions should be focusing on policies and other things more than the appointment of, of managers. We know what is happening in schools and I don't even want to name a certain union, but that is the practice and we need to move away from that and make sure that when we even appoint principals, we get people who have done, you know, management of institution courses, for instance, know how to, to manage these institutions. So like I said, there's a lot to be done, infrastructure, you know, there's still a lot to be done. You know, you go to school, some schools, you find that there is no, most of the schools don't even have proper uh, 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 labs, science labs, libraries. Most of these schools don't have those. I know it's a tall order, but we have mm -hmm. to start somewhere in making sure that, especially schools in the disadvantaged areas, we know they are obviously classified according to the Queen titles. And mm. some are lucky to go to the former model C schools where they find that the infrastructure is okay. I mean, there are schools where there are no uh, uh, sports facilities. There are schools where children still use pit latrines. We see children falling into. So these are, like I said, there's a lot, even in terms of infrastructure, which needs to be done and cannot be done overnight, but we need to start somewhere in addressing some of these issues. Mm. All right, Mme. Thank you very much um, for some of uh, those responses. Um, and maybe my one question would probably be around the funding elements. Um, mm -hmm. We saw the other day a massive protest by social workers and one mm -hmm. of the placards said, we need more social workers in schools. Mm -hmm. To your point on psychosocial challenges and the need for, for educational psychologists. And yet, if I look at it from a budgetary perspective, mm. over the last decade or so, if I account for inflation and population growth, uh, there's actually been a decline in some of the allocations in a macro fiscal framework to education um, in a context where some of the class sizes have been getting bigger. Mm -hmm. So where are we going to find the money for some of these things? The kind of social workers, the educational psychologists, the school fields, where's the money going to come from? You know, we really have to stimulate our economy for starters and mm. encourage investment and also proper allocation and proper management of funds. Mm. Maladministration is also a problem. So at times you say there's no money, but there, there could be money somewhere. So we have to look at the budget, the allocation, the rollout, you know. Like I said, it, it's not an overnight thing, but it's something that we really have to do. We know we need... A, a healthy economy for us to run a government, for us mm -hmm. to have a healthy education system. So something needs to be done. And that's why we should go back to the dream board and say, how do we then stimulate the economy so that we can address some mm -hmm. of these issues? Because education cannot suffer because there's no money. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you also raised the other issue of the role of trade unions mm -hmm. in the appointment of specific educators in the kind of system. It might be senior management uh, teams and so on. But also, I guess the other element related to that would be their role in disciplinary mechanisms. So, mm -hmm. so if we're assuming there's a performance management process, mm -hmm. it must have some element of a disciplinary uh, intervention and so on. Um, how would you change that? Is that something at the level of a regulation or is it at the level of the relationship between the district office and the leadership core in a school? 
uh, I, I feel that there has to be consequence management everywhere, mm -hmm. even in education. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why we have, because one of the rules of the unions is to even represent educators whenever there's, there's a disciplinary there's, hearing. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. Dis yeah, you know. So there's a need for that, but then also to make sure that uh, there's, there's, there's action being taken, you know. Mm. We don't just have a, a, a consequence management as in a term that there will be a disciplinary, you know, action taken. Mm. Neither mm. because of the, 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 the relationship that we see, obviously, between some of the officials and the unions, mm. you, you, we end up with lack of action in terms of, you know, teachers being taken to task. But I, I can't say that. We, we have seen a shift in terms of, you know, action being taken on, 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 on a lot of things that you see. We've mm. seen learners being impregnated by educators in the past, mm. and then nothing was done much. So I think we need to actually zoom more into some of these things and also involve parents as stakeholders. Mm. Because if we, we are going to allow the education department, the unions, to handle some of the things, but without empowering parents through the SGPs mm. because we do have H SGPs. And the community, yeah. uh, mm. You know, the involvement mm. of the community and also educate the ed parents in terms of knowing their rights and the rights of their children. Mm. You know, a lot of communities need education in that regard. Sure. You know, so that we move away from people getting away with a lot of you know and savory behavior mm. and then there's no consequence management sure. wherever there is no con consequence management there can never be performance or there can never be you know not that you instill fear in people mm. but people have to know that there is you know there's always a consequence for one's actions okay. all right Let's leave it on that point of actions. That is Action SA. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for joining us, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mme. So that uh, was uh, Mme Peggy De Brain, former MMC for Social De uh, Development in the Tswane Metro. Allow me at this stage uh, to call up uh, from the Frey Hates Front Plus, the Freedom Front Plus, uh, Mr. Yaku Mulder who's the uh, premier candidate uh, for the province of Gauteng and uh, also the education spokesperson for the Frey Aids Front Plus. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome, sir. Thank you. thank you. Yes, please give Mr. Mulder a round of applause. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mulder, I guess the question is the same, perennial question. What in the manifesto of the Frey Aids Front Plus, which I read earlier and covers a wide ambit of issues, would you like uh, to lift up this afternoon for this audience? Thank you for the opportunity and a good afternoon to all. I must say that I'm actually standing in for Dr. Weinert Bosov, who's actually our education spokesperson. So you are the sub spokesperson? <laughs> yes, I'm standing in for him. Okay. I'm also a member of parliament, we colleagues there. Okay. Um, as far as education is concerned, the Freedom Front Plus is very concerned about unions. I've heard that we talked about trade unions and um, the, de the devastation and the detrimental effect that that's got on schools. A school is supposed to be a place of safety, not a place for looting. So the Freedom Front Plus suggests that we replace the trade unions with a uh, arbitration and conciliation system that, that could be used to, 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 to sort out those sort of problems. And then the second thing that we want to, to, to mention is the high fallout or figure that we've got with our schools and we propose community and parent driven uh, mother tongue education schools um, which, which can be provided for in the system. We know that the lack of mother tongue education, uh, especially as from grade one onwards, is having a really negative effect on, 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 on people's, especially, well, even in tertiary education. So uh, community-based schools where you actually um, you, 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 you benefit a child, not a system, an education system. And then thirdly, um, the Bella Bowl um, is actually moving in the opposite direction of what the Freedom Front Plus stand for, um, taking away the decisions of language 
and cultural and um, 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 spiritual um, policies as well as, 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 as access away from the school into the education department. So we've got a problem with that. And then lastly, let me mention the, um, the whole idea of control. At the moment, provincial departments of education are actually uh, providing education and they're also um, on the control side and we think there must be an independent body who actually controls oversee education and the quality of your education, something that Imalusi most probably can fulfill. So just let me, me keep it up with that. Okay, first. all right. Let's start on just on that point of the evaluation. Um, I mean, what about the functioning of Malusi um, as a, I'm not sure if it's a Schedule 2 or Schedule 3 entity, mm. um, to you at the moment feels inadequate? Um, look, look, they should, should have a, a bigger role to play as far as the, the, the evaluation of, of, of quality education is controlled. A lot, much law is, they should, should be, at the moment, the Edu Department of Education is also fulfilling a part of that role. And I think it should be sought out to two A institutions like Umaluzi in total. I'm a parent. Mm -hmm. Just as an example, what is Malusi's role now, currently, in the system? Like, so the education department, I assume, sets the scripts. Yes. The children write the exams. The teachers, some of them mark the scripts. And Umalusi, I assume, is a quality assurance body. Yes. What do they do now that you feel, um, yes, is necessary, but not sufficient to get the outcomes you want? Okay, there should be more of an alignment between uh, the education department and themselves. Because, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. The, then the other point you are raising, just on trade unions, because I, it does seem to be a common thread, um, and I certainly note that. Um, it seems to me in your formulation, and you must clarify it for me, you want them to be designated, the teachers that is, as something atypical or typical to a essential service with some restrictions on their bargaining and associational rights. Just I, your thoughts on I that? I wouldn't say restrictions. I would say uh, alternative system. And like I mm. said, schools should be places of safety in education. Mm. Um, if we mess around with that, we've seen what the results are. So we will need alternative systems to settle uh, disputes other than what the trade unions are doing at the moment because mm. what they're doing at the moment, they leave a legacy of destruction. Mm. So, so you're proposing arbitration councils. That's correct. Yeah. How would that process be different to the current systems for resolving wage and other disputes? Well, well it, there wouldn't be a, a, a trade union that actually um, loot schools, for instance. Um, it, 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 would be a, it would be a more peaceful system than, than a trade union because lots of the trade unions are actually hiding, about, hiding a, uh, behind the members and they are causing, you know, they, they, they're into power struggles as well. So you won't have that. Last question on my end, Minir. Uh, the Bella Bill. Um, what would you say to somebody who says um, language in this country is still very much in the education sector? is a proxy and might be kind of synonymous with uneven distribution of facilities. Uh, Mepegi earlier spoke about there not being labs, uh, but if one were to survey a lot of the kind of dual medium and Afrikaans schools, many of them, because of the history we come from, would have that infrastructure. Many South Africans are saying they want their children to go to those schools. What's your thoughts on how it is that this bill is formulated that you take issue with in that regard? Unfortunately, it all has to do with politics, like we've mm. had in this province. The, the very premier of this province, Mr. Lesufi, when he used to be the MEC of Education, he targeted schools, single uh, medium language schools, mm. um, for so-called transformation. But the real reason why he did it was because the Department of Education in Gauteng did not build new schools. And I know it because I used to serve in the Gauteng Legislature mm. and I used to be a member of the Portfolio Committee for Education. If you go on oversight visits to townships and everywhere, you find that there's no, not sufficient schools. Mm. So what they do is they, they go but to schools. But there are schools closing in townships because people want their children to go to town. I, I understand, mm. but they still, they don't, they're not providing schools, even where it's needed. So what they rather do is 
They target single medium schools who are actually working, forcing them to become um, double medium schools, but for a political reason, not for the right reasons. Mm. That, no, no. That, that's what I mean. So, so I hear that, Minyar, but I think the point I'm trying to raise is that there's an observation of township schools closing because they Understand. don't have enough children occupying yes, desks understand. in those schools. And that is because the parents are opting because of perceptions of better quality infrastructure and mm -hmm. facilities to take them to schools that are in the towns, mm -hmm. some of which ostensibly are Afrikaans medium understand. or single medium schools. Um, so, so, so that's the point I'm trying to raise. Now you are saying we need to build more schools in the townships. What about the public investments that have already been made okay. in the single medium schools. Okay, let me go hmm. back. Something that I said in the beginning is that we need um, people who receive mother tongue education, regardless of what the language is. Hmm. Let's take English and Afrikaans, for instance. They got a huge advantage yes, of other children. That's true. Hmm. So why don't we give people or children the opportunity to get mother tongue education? whatever their mother tongue is. And that's why I mentioned in the beginning, we need community and parent driven based mother tongue education um, to, to actually provide for that. And it will be to a huge benefit mm. of all children, regardless of what their mother tongue is. Sure. How would that work in multicultural versus monocultural spaces? So, so in my township, say in Esbelen, you say they are, maybe that's not a good example. Say in Soweto, they are, kind of nine language groups. Mm. Um, would that mean that you need a school for Shitsonga, for Isikosa, Isizulu, um, let's assume Shona, Sindebele? How would it work? No. <laughs> look, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. If you look at the models that they've got in the Netherlands and in India, for instance, India's got how many languages? Um, we, 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 we can certainly make use of those examples. With technology nowadays, it's quite possible to accommodate those children in, in one school, but not in one class. The principle is to enforce everybody to speak either Afrikaans or English is wrong. So people must be accommodated as far as possible. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yaku. And please give Mr. Mulder a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. And last but certainly not least, um, I'm going to be joined. Uh, I, I must firstly, uh, I guess, comment uh, on the age distribution of, of my guests. Um, and I'm happy now to speak to a younger educator uh, from uh, the Youth Brigade of Inkata Freedom Party. Uh, her name is Ngosipila Zwane. She's also an educator in her, in her own right. She tells me earlier that um, she has opted not to be a member of a trade union as an educator. Please give her a round of applause. I think we can do a bit better. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Kospil. Yes. I'm well, thank you. So, Inkata Freedom Party, uh, I'm going to come back to the issue you raised on trade unions because I'm quite interested in why as a a young educator, you also don't want to, uh, I guess, use your associational and bargaining rights to be under a trade union, but we'll talk about that. Uh, but EIFP, in their manifesto, what is on offer uh, for many of the stakeholders in the system, be it parents, communities, uh, teachers themselves, and uh, more importantly, uh, the young citizens in the education system? Right. Um, greetings to everyone. I think, first of all, we can all attest that our education system is flawed and it is then resulting in producing individuals that are not skilled. So therefore, um, us as the IFP believe that the education system needs to be restructured. This goes to even restructuring budgets as we were talking to say that we believe that in South Africa there is money, but there is no money, right? So there's money, but... <laughs> there is no money. So it depends on what they are allocating the money for. Then there is money, right? But then when we have problems in the education system, then there's no money. So also part of the IFP manifesto is restructuring the budget allocation for the education system entirely. Also, um, 
being a teacher, I can attest to this, that the pass rates or the pass percentages, the requirements that must be met by our learners are lowered. They say you need 30% for tourism, for example, or any other subject, and then you need 40% to pass English home language or Isizulu home language, and then FAO, you need 40%. When you go to university and you apply, then the, the requirements are something completely different. So which means that the education system is already failing our learners because it requires them to pass at 40%, but university for access to university, then you are expected to have 60% for English, 60% uh, maybe for maths, depending on the course that you are going to do. So that also is part of our manifesto. And we also believe that the responsibility of education should start when the child leaves the house. Mm. Then education then must provide scholar transport, free scholar transport for underprivileged learners. There are kids that travel 15 kilometers before they get to school. By the time they get to school, they're exhausted. Mm. If it's raining, they can't go to school because they have to cross a river. But if we had a system that provided them with alternatives, free transport we're talking about free transport mm. because some of these villages offer transport but then it's according to parents that can afford the transport we can give them bicycles this is an alternative that if there is a road then they can use roads and they can use um, mm. trans, um bicycles something like that so if our education system, this is what we believe would benefit our learners and would benefit the education system and also minimize political interference what do you mean by that? For by example, political interference, yeah. Of obviously our trade unions, <laughs> okay. right? Um, because they go as far as to you hear that no um, comrade Mang Mang has an interest in becoming a principal in the school. Comrade, make it happen. Is he worthy? Is he qualified? You understand. So the minute I think we, we remove uh, political interference uh, will be better for the education system because then it is people that are worthy of positions, qualified of positions, experienced uh, of, uh, of these uh, positions. Then it makes sense. Um, and then address underfunding by restructuring the education system. Now I'm going back to that point. Mm. Um, previous speaker mentioned... Um, former education minister Lisufi, he was looking at improving schools which is not a bad thing mm. good right but we are also looking at the fact that the whole curriculum itself does not serve the type of learners that we have now mm. we are looking at having what do they call them i'm a 2k these are young kids that are in a system that values technology, they, they are exposed to technology. But when they go to school, we still expect them to carry 12 books. The same book I used, I'm an English teacher, I use the same book they're still using. So it's, it's, it's the process of rolling it out, you understand? So I, I can't be still using the same resources that they were still used in 2012, for example. Okay when I was doing metric, it, it, it doesn't work like that because now the target audience is not the same. Mm. They are used to technology. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. So therefore the education system must then um, accommodate that change that we are changing as people. Therefore the system must also change continuously and regularly. Also the fact that we are then going to talk about now our parents opting for I'm privileged to have taught in both. I'm now a private school teacher. I left the public school system because Why? it was frustrating. Okay. So our parents will take our kids to private schools because also they feel frustrated by the system mm. as much as the teachers, as much as everyone in the system is. Mm. Public schools are overcrowded. You have 40 plus, 60, 75 kids in one classroom, one teacher. Mm. You are able, we are supposed to serve the needs of 75 kids in an mm. hour, sometimes 45 minutes, sometimes 55 minutes. Mm. 
there's obviously a learner that is too shy to ask a question because there's everyone else and then we are not going to be able to pick up on their learning needs and their learning um, styles and all of that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's why I'm saying that the whole system, the education system is flawed. Sure. Yes. Kosko Pila, please, please help me here. And yes. I think it's a question I'd asked also to Yaku. So this issue of class sizes mm. is in a way a symptom of an underlying problem. It seems to me, I mean, to my earlier point, that you still have areas in the country where schools are closing mm. because they say there's no children. Yes. And then you also have schools within some of the townships as well that are seen as kind of pools of quality yes. and excellence. Mm. And you have class size issues and infrastructure mm. issues and all manner of other problems there. How can politicians respond to that? Because we're in election now where politicians are going to go to provincial legislatures and to the National Assembly and to the National Council of Provinces. Yes. What can politicians do to reconcile that picture for us as citizens? Because it looks a bit bizarre to me mm. that we, there are schools that are even going into a deep state of disrepair yes. where people are doing all manner of funky things in those schools mm -hmm. because there's just no children from the neighboring community taking their children to those schools. How do we fix that at the level of the provincial legislatures and national parliament, which is where we're going to be sending people? Okay, I think standardized education. By that I mean what happens in your quartile five, quartile four schools must happen to the other quartile types of schools. I think um, my former colleague here explained that the categorizing of schools mm. is what also makes it a problem. Mm. Because then we have schools that are former multiracial schools. They were well built from a long time ago. So everybody mm. wants to go there now. Then the issue is why not make sure that even in our rural schools, we have the same facilities, same infrastructure. Mm. You understand? Okay. So I think that's where the big problem is. Also the allocation. They've taken this whole grade grade R and grade 8 system mm. to say you apply online and then your, your child is placed at mm. a school that we see that it's either closer to yes. you and all of... So they're try that I get the idea that we're trying to say, let's not move our kids. Mm. Let's place them closer to schools that are closer to them. But we have preferences, obviously, mm. as parents. But the more we make sure that what happens on the right hand happens on the left hand. Then we make sure that education is standard for everyone. Don't we need money for that? It seems labs Of course. I, yeah. I told you that we, money, we have money we in have South money, Africa. Yeah. Okay. In South Africa, we do have money. It's just a, in terms of priorities. We mm. cannot say education is not a priority. Yeah. We yeah. cannot say education is not a priority. Yeah. And the fact that when we have these resources, how are they maintained and how are mm. they allocated? Mm. Two things that you spoke about, which I think are critical, I want us to touch on quickly. Uh, and we're going to get a response from one of the trade unions, so, I, so there's also that coming. Um, on scholar transport, which is also a big issue, certainly in many of the rural areas we come from, where are we missing it, according to Ingata, on this question? Because it seems to me, I understand there's a grant that comes from national that cascades down to provincial authorities, mm -hmm. who then manage a series of service providers, much similar to the passenger mm. uh, operating grant, passenger bus operating grant. Why is it that in provinces like the Eastern Cape, we are still getting a situation where, you know, service providers are, are not paid and therefore withdraw services? And what would Ingata do about that? I think the biggest response to this is corruption. When someone is allocated to make sure that the resources that are there in the department go to the right people mm. and this, that procedure is not followed, then that becomes a problem. As you are saying that money is allocated, mm. then it does not get to where it should go. That's our biggest problem. That's why I said we have money, but we don't have so money. So what are you going to do differently? Then, then Inkata is trying to make sure that by all means that, for example, if we have projects that should go to the people, they are not managed as tenders because then that's where the problem starts. So you would insource the entire... Yes. You would, you would nationalize scholar transport. It becomes a government thing. It doesn't become like a thing that now you can come bid then because if I'm your friend, I'm like, a okay. friend, uh, make sure I get it. But if it's something that we say, let us outsource resources mm. and then we make sure... Then it, 
it's sorted. Okay, all right. Yes. Last one, you spoke about curriculum reform earlier, yes. on, which I think is an important point. Yes. Um, but there are schools of specialization. There's one not far from where we're sitting now um, in this province that have been tooled appropriately to be schools targeted at, say, aviation, mechanical engineering, mm. and all of that. Um, what about those do you find problematic that you would change? Um, I'm going to make an example. I taught at a technical high school. Okay. So this is a school of specialization. Mm. Not everybody goes there except for kids that are into EGD, electrical um, technology, and all of that. So such schools are not well maintained you find that it's a big school it doesn't even have a huge population but there are not enough resources mm. like memo saying we don't have labs then equipment is not then it has a disadvantage of some sort that when your child goes to that school it's a fee-paying school they mm. make sure it's a fee-paying so school you're excluding those who can't yes pay. Yeah. those okay. that who can pay also there's equipment that you need to buy a child to go into the you don't get it for yes EGD, you don't okay, get it for free yeah. so then it excludes certain uh, people from going to those schools so until that is fixed in our system to say even the poorest of the poorest kids mm. can go anywhere they want then our education system would have been like proper because pillars one thank oh. you very much <laughs> Please give Kosipile a round of applause. Thanks, Thank you. Ma. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I think you would have heard quite a bit about trade unions. Um, and uh, I'm glad trade unions are going to get a right of reply, as we say in the media. Um, I must say myself, uh, it's quite concerning in how many manifestos the problem of education is put squarely at the hands of trade unions. Uh, both of my parents are teachers and members of a teacher trade union. Um, and I guess I'm quite puzzled about how we think about the constitutional rights to association and bargaining and how we balance that against issues of performance, but also processes of appointment and consequence management. So let me allow, I'm not sure who our representative is from the trade unions or which particular trade union. Please, Mama, sorry, sitting at the back. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. My name, is, my name is Mama, by the way. Your name um, is Mama? Yes, thank okay, you for thank calling you. me accordingly. <laughs> um, I have so many questions, but unfortunately I'm reprimanded to say I cannot ask questions, but rather put it in a form of a statement. So my question, first of all, I would like to ask, what was the whole purpose of this session here, the Manifesto of Political Parties? Because in my small and mind, it looks like they don't know what they're talking about. First of all, I don't know who employs the teachers. Is it the union who's the employer or is it the Department of Basic Education? So I would like to understand whose responsibility is it? I think we are, we are losing the plot as, as mm, also sure. yourself, sir. Also me? Yes, the department employs teachers. Yes, the the state. unions mm. are there for representing the members, the workers, yes. are there to, to represent the members in terms of labor on all other issues. And also when it comes to education, there's a lot of research that must be done. The curriculum is in its process of being strengthened, number one. Mm. We have a three-stream model that's about to be implemented, number two, which is aimed for learners who are not academically inclined to have a different pathway. So I think mm. I will end there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mama. And even the bullet that was not meant for me, I will take. Uh, no, no, I'm being serious because I think the issue that Mama is raising about different pathways is why I was asking the point on schools of specialization. But similarly, I think the point I was making earlier before your input is I would like, and I'm saying this as a citizen, I'd like us to caution against limiting associational and bargaining rights to create some kind of parallel system. Because if I'm allowed to join a trade union, as I was a member of in the broadcasting space, I don't think there's a reason why that shouldn't extend to my parents. So I think we must, we must kind of balance those things out. But I'll take the bullet, Mama, uh, even if it was not meant for me. Sorry, what is the trade? I didn't get your trade union, though. Amanda. I didn't that get the trade union. Say, Sorry, Mama. That is the name of the trade union. Oh, Amanda. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, all right. All right. Um, we, we, we don't want to waste your time, but also... We just want to 
it, it's statements and it's not questions because time is, is against us. Okay. But also, I'm, I'm, I'm very much saddened. Um, and I even question the, 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 the manifestos and, and the type of people that listen to these manifestos. And what is the action they need to take thereafter? Um, because, honestly, I'm also disappointed because people take the stage without having to research what they are coming here to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of saying, uh, we have three streams already, Dr. Smelane, I feel very sorry for you because that is your passion. But now it seems like it doesn't exist. And also, people are not even... Um, backlashing at the unions per se, but people don't even know the role of Umalus. Mm. And they don't even know the role of SAIS. Mm. So I think this is the research and this is what people need to go back and, and, and research. And also, lastly, they might also uh, uh, research the role of the unions and what the unions are doing currently. Because mm. earlier I was speaking to someone who was saying, honestly, she feels that Unions have changed their landscape, but it's not about us dropping the toy toying and whatnot. It's because we understand that we are past that. Mm. Now, this is where we are and we need to move on. There's a lot that the union, and we have five unions. You mean all these five unions? They're, they're it seems there's a singling out of one. Yes, if you read the manifestos, yes. there's one that's being singled there's out. There's one yeah. that is being singled uh, 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 one, and that is why my colleague and I had, had felt that we need mm. to respond. We thank are you, from Mama. SATU, by thank the way. Thank you very much. The and South African Democratic Teachers Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy you know the full thing. So um, I'm saying there, there are processes, there are policies. So, and the union, there, is, there are reasons for the unions to be there. Yeah. Otherwise, people want to run a banana country. Mm. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please, please give uh, the representative from Satu a round of applause. And I think I will close it off here. I've been given strict instructions um, that we are late. So I need to hand over to my brother, Kayas Tole, so Sandela Job. Um, but I think that latter point is important. Um, we have to always square all of these things up against the compact we all signed in the 90s, which is the constitution of this republic. Um, and I hope that this session has helped inform uh, some of the choices we're all going to make in the next few weeks. And from my end, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. Cheers.